All right, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone had a good weekend. So um, I am recording, just so you know. Uh, I'm in the process of turning on all of the screens around the room as well. The first thing we're going to do is actually take a top hat question. Today I have three of them. So if you wouldn't mind getting your top hat devices out, this is just a little bit of a review from next from last week. All right. So what we're going to be doing today is we're actually going to be continuing on with diffusion of uncharged particles and osmosis. So let me see here. I'm trying to get to top hat. All right. Oh, here we go. Sorry. All right. So the first question All right. So our join code is 446426. Hopefully you've already registered with Top Hat and you're in their system. What I need you to do now is text 5513 and your answer, either A, B, C, or D. Uh, and that's text to 315-636-0905. And that's at the top upper left-hand side of the screen here. Okay, so that's how you use Top Hat. And the first question today is, this is the movement of molecules from one location to the other as a result of random thermal motion. This is a definition. Is it the definition for secretion, diffusional equilibrium, diffusion, or osmotic pressure? So you have to decide this is a definition for one of these answers. A, secretion, B, diffusional equilibrium, C, diffusion, or D, osmotic pressure. All right, we're doing really well already. 86 people have answered. So I'm going to go ahead and give you about 10 more seconds. All right. Does anyone in this room need a little more time? Make sure I peek around the columns here. Sometimes it's hard to see some of these other tables. All right, so the correct answer is C, diffusion. All right, good job. 93 of you got that right, perfect. So let's go to the next question. This one is also pertaining to diffusion. So this one asks, the net diffusion will always proceed from blank concentration to blank concentration. Is it A, high to low, B, low to high, C, molar to osmolar, or D, low to zero? Everyone is doing really well. Again, we're already up to about 83 students answering. So I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. I usually like to do the countdown when there's about 85 or so students that have answered. OK, anyone else in this room need a little more time? Anybody need a little more time? All right. So I'm going to close this one out. And the correct answer is A. All right, good job. All right, this one's a little more difficult. This is the last one for today. The chemical or concentration gradient can be thought of as a, a statistical force, B, electrical force, C, current, or D, flux. So this one's a little bit more difficult. All 
In this case, if you'd like to, you can turn to your neighbor, just verify, ask them a question. Do you think this is right? What did you say? That's perfectly fine. All right, we have about 85 students who have answered. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. All right, does anyone need a little more time in this room? Anyone need a little more time? Okay, yep, yep. I'll give you about five more seconds. Just give me a thumbs up when you're ready. All right, sounds good. All right, so what is the answer? Go ahead and close this. And the correct answer is A, statistical force. That always happens. Okay. So for those of you that answered flux, you're partially right. Okay, you remembered Fick's Law of Diffusion. Just remember that concentration is just one variable that participates in the calculation of flux. Okay, so you have to also, you know, incorporate uh, the membrane thickness, the radius of the molecule, the viscosity, right? That all is calculated to determine flux. A statistical force is the correct answer, okay? And I want you to remember that because uh, what we talked about was uh, the concentration gradient can also be thought of as the chemical gradient or chemical force. And it really is just about probabilities, right? The probability that uh, molecules are going to collide with each other and move across the pore is higher going from high concentration to low concentration than the other way, okay? So it's really only about probabilities. We call that a statistical force, even though it's not a real force. But I do, this is going to come into play when we talk about diffusion of charged particles on Wednesday. Okay, so keep it on, in mind. This can also be thought of as a, a statistical force. All right, great job, everyone. So let's go ahead and continue on. We are going to run some numbers today. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind getting out your problem set number one, that would be wonderful. Uh, I passed those out on Friday. I only have a few copies here if you need one. I mean, seriously, I only have like five copies. But if you'd like to come up and grab one, you sure can. There you go. All right. There you go. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Need one? Yes. All right. So, uh, all right, you got my last one. Okay. There you go. All right. Um, with that, so what I'd like you to do is, since we already talked about Fick's Law of Diffusion, and this is the diffusion of uncharged particles from the continuum perspective, if you remember that, what that means is Fick actually saw diffusion as like billiard balls moving in a straight line until they collided with another molecule or went across the membrane through a pore. All right, That's how he saw uh, diffusion. Why don't you go ahead and do the first two problems on this problem set. Turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself if you don't know them yet. Do the first two problems and we'll actually talk about it on the back end here. Give you about five minutes to do that. I wish you had a copy. Oh, perfect. Uh, I have an extra copy if someone needs one. Okay. Actually, I have two extra copies if someone needs one. 
Did you know? Oh, no, I had a different question. Um, I must have not, like, clicked, like oh. submit, so I just wanted to make sure, like, you, that's not the question sure. that you looked at for attendance. Yeah, something. you know what? Um, can we, like, talk about it right after class? Yeah. And then I can look you up and let you know if you're in the system. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I think All right, how many of you need a little more time? All right, okay, I'll give you a, a couple more minutes. Just give me a thumbs up when you are ready. but it's just not the kind of learning that I'm very accustomed to. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of like reflections oh, and sure. like all of that, so. Oh. Oh, perfect. Yes, that's perfect. Yep, yep, I like that. Just one. Great. All right. How are you? You guys good over there now? Just, is everybody okay? Great. All right. So we can go ahead and get started. All right. So the first one. Um, what do you think? Uh, what is what will happen to Netflix? Okay. Let's start over. Just so you remember, we talked about this. If you actually look at Fick's equation, we uh, Fick's law of diffusion, we decided, we talked about this, I think, I have two sections, um, anything in the numerator, like the concentration gradient, is going to have a direct relationship with net flux. So if the concentration gradient increases, then the net flux is going to increase. That's going to be the same for area as well and temperature. So anything in the numerator is going to have a direct relationship with net flux. Anything in the denominator here on the bottom is going to have an inverse relationship. So if the membrane thickness decreases, right, then net flux is going to increase. So and that's the same with radius and viscosity. So that's just an easy way to look at uh, Fick's Law and try to figure out in your head these different relationships. Number one is what you can expect on an exam. So let's do the first one. What will happen to net flux in moles per second if the following variables were changed? A, increased viscosity of the solvent would, you can, yes, decrease, right? You can just say it out loud. 
How about decrease temperature? Decrease. Decreased concentration gradient. Decreased. Increased membrane thickness. Decrease. Increased radius of the solute. Decrease. Increased surface area. That's right. That's the only one that will increase. Perfect. So what about number two? This one's a little bit more difficult. What will happen to net flux in moles per second of an uncharged solute as the system approaches diffusional equilibrium? So in this case, you have to, it's kind of a two-step. You have to know what diffusional equilibrium is. How is that going to change the equation? And then what is the answer? Okay, so what do you think? What do you, what did you get? A, B, C, or D? C would be the correct answer, right? So let me just step you through it. The net flux will become zero as it reaches diffusional equilibrium. Why is that? Because as the net flux, I'm sorry, as you reach or start getting closer to diffusional equilibrium, the concentration gradient decreases, right? So if it's going to decrease, right, the net uh, flux will decrease until it becomes zero as it reaches diffusional equilibrium. Because at diffusional equilibrium, there's no concentration gradient. The concentration is the same on both sides, right? So then the flux will be zero. Are there any questions? All right, so that's what we did last week. Before we get to, I'm going to let you do number three at home. But we're going to get to number four here. We're going to actually do that as a group. Let me just step you through Einstein's relation. I started to talk about this on Friday. This is what I, where I left off. Um, I told you that with Einstein's relation, Einstein saw diffusion, right? Not completely, but very differently. He actually uh, saw little particles within a microscope. Uh, he noticed that they hopped around like little fleas, right? This is known as Brownian movement. And you can kind of plot their journey. This is three different uh, colloidal particles that were, were um, on this grid. You could plot out where they went every 30 seconds. And you can see that it's pretty random. So Einstein observed this. He actually recognized it. He called it the random walk, or drunkard's walk, actually. Um, and this is actually an uh, illustration that was reproduced from a book by Jean Perrin in Les Atomes. Again, I am not French. I'm so sorry. I'm just butchering all those French terms. Uh, but essentially, again, the significance of was, this was uh, Jean Perrin actually won the Nobel Prize in the 1920s. Uh, he could verify Avogadro's number with his observations here, which was really interesting. Uh, again, Einstein saw the same observations. How do you make sense of a random walk, right? Well, he did, and we talked about this last time too. You can see uh, this is a very two-dimensional model, but over time these particles are going to spread out until they actually kind of, you can see this Gaussian curve, and you can... Uh, you can describe this mathematically by using, this is what Einstein did, he came up with this particular equation from his observations. x squared equals 2dt. Now d is the same diffusion coefficient that we talked about in Fick's law, right? This is the exact same diffusion coefficient. kt, the thermal agitation, over 6 pi, R is the radius, V is the viscosity. Same thing here. But the brilliance of Einstein's re uh, relation here is that he is illustrating and comparing the distance traveled to the time that it takes to diffuse. All right? That's the brilliance of this particular equation. Just so you know that if we start to think about this in three dimensions, this particular equation gets very complicated. And actually, as the diffusion of a particle increases, it even slows the time even more when you think about it in three dimensions. Okay, So um, 
with that, what I want to do is let's get you started. Today's more of a kind of an active classroom. So I want you to work in groups and do problem number four. All right, we'll come back together afterwards and talk about it. So it looks like some are done, some I still see some pencils going. How many need a little more time? Okay, yep, I'll give you about a couple more minutes. And I know some of the mathematics are Trivial for some, for others, you know, this is, uh, I've, I've had a lot of students, maybe uh, some older students that have come back and said, oh my gosh, I haven't done math in 10 years. This kind of intimidates me. So I understand that, you know, there's a lot of variability, diversity in this course, and that's perfectly fine. If you have any uh, issues with some of these equations, that's why I walk you through it. Now, on Wednesday, when we do the diffusion of charged particles, we're going to really start to um, ramp it up a little bit. But I will walk you through it. All right. How are we doing? Does anyone else need a little more time at this point? All right. So what did you get? Let's just start with the answer. C? Okay, C, yes. All right. Let me just, you're absolutely right. Yes. So, but if you didn't get that right, let me just go through it just to make sure that we're all on the same page, okay? So what I like to do is take a look at some of the units, right? Two millimeters is going to be the X value, right? D which is the diffusion coefficient, is right here. It's going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 5th centimeters squared per second. Now, take a look at this. Our units are already off, and we need to make sure that they're consistent. So what I like to do, this is what I do, is I already convert millimeters to centimeters just to make it easy 
on myself. Okay, so I'm going to set up the question this way. Two millimeters equals 0 0.2 centimeters. Okay, so I'll set it up. X is going to be 0 0.2 centimeters times 0 0.2 centimeters, right, because it's x squared, is equal to 2 times 1 times 10 to the minus 5th centimeters squared per second, and we're trying to solve for t. Everybody with me? Pretty good? That's how I set it up. All right, so we do some calculations. We get 0 0.04 centimeters squared, because we multiplied these two together. Divide that by 2 times, I just go, went ahead and multiplied these together, 2 times 10 to the minus 5th centimeters squared per second, right? And that equals T. All right, centimeters, centimeters cancel out. Just make sure your units are correct. And T is going to be in seconds. So what did you get here? 2,000. That's absolutely right. 2,000 seconds. Now, I'm going to tell you that the, the most common mistake that I see is that students in an exam are stressed. They're worried about time, right? They say, oh, 2,000 seconds. Okay, two, 200 seconds. Close enough. And they circle B, right? Okay, that's not the correct answer. You're going to have to make sure that you actually do some dimensional analysis. 2,000, be confident in your, your answer. It is 2,000 seconds. We're gonna to have to convert that. One way to start converting it is, let's do some dimensional analysis, right? One minute over 60 seconds. We're gonna multiply that together, right? Divide 2,000 by 60 to get minutes, and that's how we got 33. 0.3 minutes. Okay, pretty good? All right, so now we're going to do something that's not on this, this sheet. Now I want you to actually just calculate it again using centimeters. I want you to calculate this again with two centimeters. An epithelial cell is two centimeters from the nearest capillary. And tell me what T is. Use the same equation, x squared equals 2dt, and what'd you get? What will you get? You don't have to make the conversion this time. Anybody had the answer yet? Nobody yet. Yes. That's right. Fifty five. Point six hours, is that right? Yep, which is over two days, right? That's pretty amazing, right? When you think about it, if a molecule had to diffuse two millimeters, it'd take about a half hour. But you bump that up to two centimeters, which doesn't seem like a huge change, but now it goes from half an hour to over two days, right? So this gives you an idea of the power of this equation, right? Einstein actually really illustrated 
the relationship between time and distance when it came to diffusion. Okay, so what else is really important here? What's really important is diffusion times increase in proportion to the square of the distance over the molecule, which the molecules diffuse. And that diffusion is limited by distance. This is the take home message. Diffusion is limited by distance. So if we're talking about the diffusion of neurotransmitters across a synaptic cleft, which is maybe 20 microns, that's acceptable, right? These molecules can diffuse in milliseconds. That's very acceptable. But if they have to diffuse down an entire neuron, in a giraffe, a neuron down its neck could be a meter long. It would take 32 years if you had to rely on diffusion alone, right? So that's not acceptable. In our body, what have, what have animals evolved to compensate for those limitations of diffusion? What have we evolved to compensate for the limitations of diffusion? How do we transport things? The heart, the vascular system, right? The circulatory system is one thing that you have evolved in order to transport molecules throughout your body. Perfect. Also, another one, when we get to neurons, I'm going to show you a movie. And I think this is fascinating. I want you to make these connections. Um, anyone studied neurons already in neurobiology? You actually know that the neurotransmitters are actually transported down the axon by microtubules, railways, right? Um, and it's really cool that we've evolved these molecular motors called kinesins. They actually walk along like end over end, like feet. They walk along the microtubules to transport those neurotransmitters down to the neuro, um, the synaptic cleft, right? That axon terminal end, which is really cool. Think about it this way. When a kinesin molecule is attached to a microtubule, it reduces dimensionality, right? It makes it go from a three-dimensional structure, like to diffuse in, to two dimensions, and it actually increases the time. Okay, I said before, remember our x squared equals 2 dt is really two-dimensional. And if we go to a three-dimensional model, it's going to be much more complicated and it's going to slow the time even more. Okay, so by having these molecular motors walk down microtubules, when you think about Einstein's relation, it's reducing dimensionality to help speed up the time, actually. Okay, so think about that. That's kind of a little bit of a brain teaser just to make some of these connections. All right, so diffusion is limited by distance. If a substance has to diffuse a long distance, it would be very slow. Therefore, it would not be an effective way to move solutes. So, our bodies have evolved different mechanisms to help with the limitations of diffusion. Another example that I want to talk about is angiogenesis. Okay, just going to roll out this term. It's an interesting illustration, again, of the limitations of diffusion. Angiogenesis is a term that we use to describe growth of new blood vessels. Okay, so the limiting effect of diffusion on cell growth is dramatically illustrated in solid tumors. All right, so I'm going to skip to this one. I'll go back. This is interesting. This was actually a figure that Judah Folkman, you can see that at the bottom here, in 1971, uh, put together to illustrate the limitations of diffusion. So. This little small dot here on the left-hand side is a tumor, solid tumor. And what he observed was that with time, these tumors grew until they got to about two millimeters cubed in size. Okay? And then they became limited in their growth because they couldn't get enough oxygen and nutrients to diffuse close with all the cells that were in this compact structure. 
So what happened is these tumors actually evolved the ability to secrete what Judah Folkman thought at the time was tumor activating factor. We now know this as VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay, when these tumors start to secrete VEGF, you can see angiogenesis occurs. It actually attracts more blood vessels, right? This is new blood vessel growth that helps to transport oxygen and nutrients directly to the tumor. And then once these tumors are perfused, they can come, become unlimited in size, all right? It's a very nice example of how diffusion is limited over macroscopic distances, okay? So, kind of interesting. Um, so actually, let me finish up this story. Judah Folkman came up with an idea at the time that he was gonna develop a drug that would choke off the blood supply to any kind of tumor to keep it at two millimeters in size. Unfortunately, there were other factors involved and it wasn't the cure-all that he wanted it to be, but it's still actually included in a lot of chemotherapy agents. Okay, he called these statins. Um, so that's interesting, that's interesting. All right, so angiogenesis is one of the six acquired cellular capabilities leading to malignant growth. And that angiogenic switch is the moment at which a tumor begins to overexpress pro-angiogenic factors. Remember, you're recruiting new blood vessels, such as vascular endothelial growth factor. And you get then sustained angiogenesis one of the six acquired cellular capabilities leading to malignant growth. And then this is really an interesting slide. It actually shows you two rat tumors. Uh, one has the capability, these were implanted in an experiment that occurred a long time ago, but I still like to kind of show what's happening here. These two tumors, one has the capability to release BEGF, the other one doesn't. You can actually see the angiogenic switch, which leads to neovascularization. And this tumor right here is non-angiogenic. The other one is angiogenic, and you can actually see how it is absolutely recruiting new blood vessels to that tumor. Okay, so interesting. After about 12 days, about two weeks. All right, so any questions about this so far? Uh, question number three on your problem set. You can do this at home. This is more of a two-step process. So you actually have to use um, this first one, 10 millimeters, or I'm sorry, one millimeter in one second. And then you have to solve for D first. Once you solve for D, then you can change the X to 10 millimeters. That's how you do that problem. So I'm gonna let you do that at home. I just wanna make sure that everyone knows how to do that. If you have any questions in the meantime, even before class, just come on up and we can discuss it. All right, so let's move on to osmosis. Like I said, I wanna go through this systematically and slowly because when we get to the diffusion of charged particles, it can get complicated very quickly. And we'll be talking about the Nernst equation, resting membrane potential, and the equilibrium potentials. All right, so next lecture is I'll talk to you a little bit about it. Osmosis is just an extension of what you know about diffusion, okay? So that's kind of the take home message right here. Osmosis is the extension of what, okay? So we'll get into that in just a second. This shouldn't take too long. All right. I'll let you read these learning objectives at home. This will just help you study when you start getting closer to the first exam. And this is a slide that's illustrating, giving you some information about two different solutions. They actually had two different ionic comp uh, compositions. They have some uncharged and charged particles, okay? Uh, they look very different, but they actually have very similar colligative properties. And each one of these ions or uncharged solutes act as an osmolite. So 
they basically have the same concentration of osmolites, even though they are different solutions. Okay, so expanding on that, um, let's talk about the idea of mole fraction here. This is the idea of mole fraction. Um, let's just pretend for a second. I know this can't, I can't actually do this experiment, but this is what this illustration is all about. If I could take pure water and take a scalpel and cut out a perfect cube, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So I have a perfect cube of pure water. Okay, think about that. If I add solute to that perfect cube, What's going to happen, take a look at this on the right-hand side. As I add solute to pure water, the blue is the water, I actually displace the water molecules. This is like a volume clamping experiment. I can't adjust the volume at all. But as I add solute, I displace the water molecules out of that volume and I lower the water molecule concentration, okay? Now, when I said osmosis is just an extension of diffusion, what I meant by that is now water molecules are always going to proceed, again, the net diffusion from high concentration to low concentration. So when you look at these two cubes right now, which way is the net diffusion of water going to proceed? Is it going to go from left to right or right to left? When you think of the net diffusion of water, what do you think? Anyone want to take a stab at it? What's that? left to right, right? It's going to go from left to right. All right, so that's not too hard. I know you're just being shy. Everyone's just shy right now. Okay, but here's where it gets tricky for students. All right, I'm going to blow this up because this is the, this is the illustration that you usually get in your textbook, right? Let me just blow this up a little bit. All right, now tell me which one has the higher water molecule concentration when you look at compartment O and compartment I, outside and inside. Which one of these has the higher water molecule concentration? It is the inside compartment. This is where it gets really tricky. These circles are representing the solute. So what you have to do is you have to see the space in between the solute molecules and take a look at, and when you take a look at this you should say oh okay this has the higher water molecule concentration than the outside compartment so if water has a pathway the net diffusion of water is actually going to go from inside to outside right that's tricky and I'm just, I mean, maybe it's not for some, but I do get that question all the time. Because if someone doesn't explain these marks, you know, it can be confusing. So these circles are solute, and the space is the solvent. And the water is really the solvent. Okay? So let's go back to our discussion here. Formal definition of osmosis is the net diffusion of water across a membrane. And just like we talked about with diffusion, the net diffusion of water is always going to proceed from high concentration to low concentration. Now, water can move across the plasma membrane, but not as easily as some of your organs would like, like the kidney. So there are channels called aquaporin channels that really facilitate the movement of water. We'll talk about vasopressin and how that inserts aquaporin channels to help you concentrate urine, okay? So that'll come later on. Like I said, osmosis and diffusion is really the heart of understanding the kidney. Okay, so aquaporin expression and insertion into the membrane varies among cell types, but it's very important in the kidney. 
and this is just a structural model of aquaporin channels. All right, so moving right along, what you see here is the osmotic concentration is the total solute concentration of a solution, and one osmol is equal to one mole of solute particle. So if we add one molar solution of glucose, that would be one osmol. Okay. However, if we have one molar solution of sodium chloride, how many osmols is that going to be? You can discuss with your neighbor. I hear the answer on this table over here, table number two. What did you say? Two. That is correct. One molar solution of sodium chloride is going to be two osmoles in solution, and that is assuming that all of the sodium and chloride dissociate from each other. All right, for our purposes, that doesn't always happen. That doesn't happen. But for our purposes, hypothetically, we're going to say that they completely dissociate into two osmoles. The greater the osmolarity of a solution, the greater the osmotic pressure. All right, so this is more of a review slide. We've already kind of discussed it, so don't worry that I'm kind of skipping through it. Remember, one molar solution of sodium chloride contains two osmoles of a solute per liter. All right, you can kind of read through this when you get home, but it's exactly what I've already talked about. Let's move on to osmotic pressure. We have a few more minutes here, but I think I can get you down the road so that you can do those last two problems. And then we'll move on to diffusion of charged particles on Wednesday. So taking a look at this experiment right here, what you have is a container, a cylinder, with a piston. Okay, this is a piston. On one side, on the left-hand side, is a solution. You can see it's very concentrated. And on the other side is pure water. All right, so you already know that the net diffusion of water is going to go from pure water into the solution. And as it does that, it actually displaces the piston, right? And it keeps doing that slower and slower, okay? The force that it would take to that mechanical force, the force that it would take to keep that piston in place is actually equal to the osmotic pressure. So the mechanical force that you would have to apply to keep that piston in place is equal to the osmotic pressure. So here's a formal definition of the osmotic pressure. When a solution containing solutes is separated from pure water by a semi-permeable membrane, the pressure that must be applied to prevent the net flow of water is the osmotic pressure. And we can calculate that with this equation. In this case, pi is not 3.14, right? That's not pi. Pi in this case, I mean, it is pi. But in this case, pi is equal to the osmotic pressure. It's representing the osmotic pressure. It's equal to the pressure inside minus the pressure outside. And that's equal to ideal gas constant, which is right here, times temperature in Kelvin. Multiply that by the concentration inside minus the concentration outside. All right? So for our example, you have to use the ideal gas constant. I'm down here at the bottom, 0 0.082. Multiply that. So to actually adjust to Kelvin, what you do is you take 25 degrees Celsius and add 273. That gives you 298. Usually I'll give you the temperature in Celsius. So all you have to do is add 273. Multiply that, and then the concentration inside and the concentration minus the concentration outside. And that will give you 22 atmospheres. All right. Uh, there's some animations. That's what these are. So you can take a look at that at home. And since I've run out of time, I will talk about tonicity for the first five minutes on Wednesday before we get into the diffusion of charged particles. Now, also... Um, you should be able to do all of your problem set at this point. Meghna asks if you can turn them in at the beginning of class so she can grade them right away. You can pick them up right after class. 
and you can use it as a study aid. So if you bring it in right away and give it to Megna on Wednesday, they that can would leave be, it in the back there. Yeah, you can leave it in the back. That'd be wonderful. All right, have a wonderful Tuesday, everyone. I will see you on Wednesday. Oh, I